Um, so, yep, we are very grateful and happy that Dr. Pringsheim is presenting the webinar today. She's a professor at the University of Calgary, Department of Clinical Neurosciences, Psychiatry, Pediatrics and Community Health Services, uh, Program Lead of Tourette and Pediatric Movement Disorders, Deputy Director of Clinical Research at the Matheson Centre for Mental Health Research and Education, President of the Tourette OCD Alberta Network, and is an evidence-based medicine methodologist of the American Academy of Neurology. Thank you, Dr. Pringsheim. Thank you for the introduction, Julian, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us this morning. So uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the treatment of ADHD in people with Tourette syndrome and or obsessive compulsive disorder. Sorry, my slides don't wanna go ahead. There we go. So my objectives are to discuss the epidemiology, clinical characteristics and natural history of ADHD in people with Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder, and to review treatment strategies for ADHD and how these may be affected by these comorbid conditions. So why are we talking about this? ADHD symptoms certainly appear to be more common in people who are diagnosed with Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. And the treatment of ADHD symptoms in people with Tourette syndrome and or obsessive compulsive disorder may be complicated by worsening of tics or obsessive compulsive behaviors. So before we delve into this, I thought we should just all make sure we're on the same page. I know that you're all experts on ADHD, but we'll just briefly review our DSM-5 criteria for ADHD. So people with ADHD do show a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity or impulsivity that interfere with function and development. To, to meet the diagnostic criteria, you have to have six or more symptoms of inattention if you're under the age of 16 or five or more if you're over the age of 17. The symptoms of inattention have to be present for at least six months and they are inappropriate for a developmental level. For hyperactivity and impulsivity, you must have six or more symptoms if you're less than 16, five or more if you're over 17. And again, they have to be present for at least six months uh, to an extent that is disruptive and inappropriate for the person's developmental level. So these are the core symptoms of inattention. So failing to give close attention to details or making careless mistakes, having trouble holding attention on tasks, uh, not listening when spoken to directly, not following through on instruction, failing to finish work, having difficulties with organization, avoiding uh, tasks that require uh, mental effort over long periods, losing things necessary for tasks and activities, being easily distracted and forgetful. In terms of symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity, uh, the person is observed to frequently uh, fidget or squirm, leave their seat in situations where remaining seated is expected, such as the dinner table or uh, their desk in the classroom, uh, running or climbing about in situations where it is inappropriate, uh, being unable to play or take part in activities quietly, uh, being described as on the go or driven by a motor, talking excessively, uh, blurting out answers, having difficulty waiting one's turn, or often interrupting or intruding on others. So uh, again, to meet the DSM-5 criteria, several symptoms must be present before the age of 12, and symptoms must be present in two or more settings, such as home, school, or work. And there has to be clear evidence that the symptoms interfere with or reduce the quality of social, school, or work functioning. The symptoms cannot be better explained by another mental disorder. So people can be diagnosed with a combined presentation if they have symptoms of both inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity for six months. There can also be a predominantly inattentive presentation if 
people meet the uh, criteria for inattention but not hyperactivity, and there can also be a predominantly hyperactive impulsive presentation. So just briefly touching on what is Tourette syndrome. Uh, this is a childhood onset neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by motor and vocal tics. It is more common in boys than girls by a, a factor of three to one. Uh, patients have multiple motor tics and at least one vocal tic. And it must be, the symptoms must be present for at least one year and typically demonstrate a waxing and waning pattern. For the DCM-5 for uh, criteria for OCD uh, is characterized by the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. Obsessions are recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or impulses that are intrusive and unwanted and cause anxiety or distress. People attempt to ignore or suppress these thoughts uh, or neutralize them through another thought or action. Compulsions are repetitive behaviors or mental acts that an individual feels compelled to perform in response to an obsessive thought. The behaviors or mental acts that are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress um, are not connected in a realistic way to what they are designed to neutralize or prevent or are clearly excessive. A note is that uh, children may not be able to articulate the aims of their behaviors or mental acts. The obsessions and compulsives, compulsions are typically time uh, consuming, uh, take more than one hour a day, or cause significant distress or impairment. And they're not attributable to a, a medication, uh, a substance, or another mental disorder. So let's talk, let's, let's start by talking about comorbid ADHD in people with Tourette syndrome. So approximately 50% of people with Tourette syndrome are also diagnosed with ADHD. ADHD symptoms typically precede uh, the tick onset. Uh, there are lower rates of comorbidity seen within community-derived samples. So, uh, there, we would see comor comorbidity of 25 to 35% compared to 50% uh, in specialist centers. Uh, comorbidity rates between tics and ADHD seem higher with more severe tic disorders. So the rate of comorbidity in people with Tourette syndrome is higher than in people with transient tics or chronic motor tic disorder. So there's, there are shared symptoms between these uh, two disorders. Uh, we see impairments in attention and control in both disorders, hyperactivity behavior. They're both strongly associated with anxiety and behavior problems, as well as obsessive compulsive behaviors. In both disorders, we see uh, difficulties uh, or issues with sensory processing. There's a higher rate of mood disorders, sleep disturbances, there can be impairments in socialization and communication, and there are repetitive patterns of behavior. So there is evidence to suggest that Tourette syndrome and ADHD have a shared etiology. Uh, there seems to be a similar neuropathology between Tourette syndrome and ADHD, which is characterized by long range underconnectivity and short range overconnectivity. So in normal brain development, there's a shift that occurs from local processing, so that's the short range connectivity, to more global processing, which is long range connectivity. And with age, there's pruning of local connectivity and strengthening of the long range connectivity. Uh, brain connectivity problems could be due to a neuronal insult, or be genetically determined. And there's evidence that deficits in brain connectivity correlate with the severity of both tick and ADHD symptoms. So if we contrast Tourette syndrome plus ADHD versus ADHD only, ADHD severity is minimally greater in children who have both Tourette syndrome and ADHD compared to children with ADHD only. 
If we look at the age of onset, it is similar in kids that have both disorders versus ADHD only. The frequency of mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and disruptive behavior disorders is similar in children uh, with both of these conditions. However, the frequency of OCD is higher in children with Tourette syndrome and ADHD versus children with ADHD only. So how does the co-occurrence of ADHD impact children with Tourette syndrome? So it seems that children that have ADHD and Tourette syndrome are treated for their tick symptoms earlier compared to children who only have Tourette syndrome. And this is without having greater tick severity. Uh, it is hypothesized that this could be related to greater overall psychosocial impairment in children that are affected by both disorders. It is logical that co-occurring ADHD may impair uh, one's ability to suppress their tics, and that the mental effort to suppress one's tics may accentuate inattention in ADHD. The presence of comorbid ADHD may moderate the effectiveness of alpha agonists for the treatment of tics, with studies showing that uh, alpha agonists are more effective for tics in children who are diagnosed with Tourette syndrome and ADHD compared to Tourette syndrome only. The risk for aggressive and delinquent behavior as well as conduct problems in children with Tourette syndrome is posed largely by the presence of ADHD. If you compare children with Tourette syndrome to children with Tourette's and ADHD, there is much higher rates of behavior problems uh, in children with Tourette syndrome plus ADHD. And the greatest independent predictor of psychosocial quality of life in children with, AD with Tourette syndrome is ADHD symptom severity. So those children who have more severe ADHD symptoms will have uh, more impaired psychosocial quality of life. So what is the treatment priority in these children? Is it their tics or is it their ADHD symptoms? ADHD symptoms usually cause greater impairment in cognitive, emotional, and social skills than tics, unless the tics are very severe. So in all cases, the treatment should prioritize the symptoms that are causing the most impairment. And I'd say in nine cases out of 10, this would be ADHD rather than tics. So what are, the, what are the specifics regarding treating ADHD in children with tics? So we actually did uh, a Cochrane review on this specific topic, uh, which was published uh, four years ago um, uh, by um, my team uh, at the Alberta Children's Hospital, as well as a colleague from Toronto. And we, our objective was to assess the effects of pharmacological treatments for ADHD in children with tic disorders uh, and what the effects of these pharmacological agents were on symptoms of both ADHD and tics. And this was a systematic review of randomized controlled trials of any pharmacological treatment for ADHD used specifically in children who had both ADHD and Tourette syndrome. We found eight randomized controlled trials, including 510 participants, uh, mostly boys, so 443 boys and 67 girls. All studies were performed in the United States and the trials uh, length ranged from three to 22 weeks. Several trials assessed multiple drugs and the medications assessed included methylphenidate, clonidine, dizipramine, dextroamphetamine, guanfacine, adamoxetine, and deprinil. So let's talk about methylphenidate first, and this is the summary of, of our analysis on the, uh, on the trials that assess methylphenidate. So if we look at ADHD symptom-related behavior, uh, the study showed a significant improvement in ADHD symptoms 
uh, in children who were treated with methylphenidate. Uh, so the Tourette syndrome study group showed a significant treatment effect on the Connors abbreviated teacher rating scale by three points. Um, another study uh, showed that all the, all the doses, they, they tested multiple doses of methylphenidate that all were superior to, uh, to placebo uh, on their measures of ADHD uh, severity. Um, and the third study found, again, found the same thing, decreased hyperactivity at all doses of methylphenidate. If we look at uh, the results with respect to tick severity with methylphenidate, the Tourette syndrome study group found a significant treatment effect uh, with a decrease of 11 points on the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale, uh, which is a very large treatment effect. Uh, another study uh, found no difference on the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale, uh, but found on the Global Tick Rating Scale completed by teachers that there was a significant effect. Uh, and finally, a third study uh, found no effect on tick severity uh, in two of their cohorts, uh, but in, in another one, there was greater tick severity uh, during the second week of treatment. I want to take a deeper dive into the Tourette syndrome study group um, study, which I think is uh, one of the most important clinical trials uh, that has been performed in people with Tourette syndrome and ADHD. And this was a randomized controlled trial in 136 children who had both diagnoses. And these children uh, were treated for 16 weeks. They were randomized to one of four groups. So they're randomized to clonidine alone, methylphenidate alone, combined clonidine and methylphenidate, or placebo. And their uh, ADHD uh, symptom, they, they demonstrated ADHD symptom improvement on the, uh, on the teacher report. And so the amount of improvement with clonidine alone versus placebo was 3.3 point, uh, points. Uh, with methylphenidate versus placebo also was 3.3 points. And uh, with the combination of clonidine and methylphenidate, uh, the improvement was doubled at 6.3 points. If we look at their uh, tick severity on the Yale Global Tick Severity Score, uh, with clonidine alone, alone uh, there is an improvement of 10.9 points. With methylphenidate, there is an improvement of 9.4 points. And with the combination, there is an improvement of 11 points. So worsening of ticks was reported as an adverse effect in 20% of children receiving methylphenidate, 22% of children receiving placebo, and 26% of children receiving clonidine. And I think this is really important, uh, a really important point to share with patients um, that the rate of tick worsening was the same in all three groups. There is a, a but, <laughs> and that's that ticks limited further dosage increases more often in participants assigned to methylphenidate alone than participants assigned to methylphenidate plus clonidine, uh, clonidine alone or placebo. So when they really tried to push up the high, the doses of methylphenidate, it did lead to, uh, to uh, more ticks. The data from the Tourette syndrome study group suggests that methylphenidate and clonidine have similar efficacy in treating ADHD symptoms and that their combination is superior to either treatment alone. Now, these findings of equivalent effects of methylphenidate and clonidine are contrary to clinical experience in which stimulants are usually more effective than alpha agonists in most patients. And this unexpected result may be due to the low doses of methylphenidate used in the study. So the mean dose of methylphenidate uh, it was uh, 25 milligrams per day, which would be considered at the lower uh, at the lower end of this prescribing uh, range. 
So uh, our Cochrane review also looked at dextroamphetamine, and there's only one placebo-controlled crossover study of dextroamphetamine, which included 20 children. And this was a short-acting form, so it was dosed uh, twice daily, and they assessed three different doses. So 7.5 twice a day, 15 twice a day, and 22.5 twice a day. Uh, and they did observe an increase in tick severity with both the 15 and 22.5 uh, milligram dose. And there was improved ADHD symptom severity seen with all three doses. Looking at clonidine, uh, I've already shown you the data from the Tourette syndrome study group, but ADHD symptoms uh, improved uh, in the Tourette syndrome study group using clonidine. Uh, another study uh, did not find uh, a significant difference on their ADHD outcome measures, except for um, nervous overactive behavior. Again, looking at tick severity with clonidine, the Tourette syndrome study group found an improvement in tick severity with clonidine, and then another study did not demonstrate a significant difference. For guanfacine, there's one eight-week study of guanfacine versus placebo in 34 children with Tourette syndrome and ADHD. And it was found that guanfacine significantly reduced symptoms of ADHD on the ADHD rating scale total score and ticks on the Yale Global uh, Tick Severity Scale total tick score. And finally, adamoxetine. There's a parallel group study of 148 children for 18 weeks. And their primary objective was to test the hypothesis that adamoxetine does not worsen ticks in children with Tourette syndrome and ADHD relative to placebo, uh, they were able to demonstrate a significant improvement in ADHD symptoms on the ADHD rating scale total score with adamoxetine compared to placebo. Adamoxetine was non-inferior to placebo on the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale, so ticks decreased by 5.5 points in the adamoxetine group and by three points uh, in the placebo group. So the ticks decreased in both groups and there was no significant difference between them. So the conclusions from the systematic review uh, are that psychostimulants should be considered a first line treatment of ADHD in children with ticks. There's more evidence to support the use of methylphenidate than dextroamphetamine. And really the lowest effective dose should be used of methylphenidate uh, um, as the doses in the studies were at the lower end and higher doses of dextroamphetamine worsen ticks. If ticks are exacerbated by psychostimulants, evidence to support the use of, uh, there is evidence to support the use of clonidine and guanfacine for both ADHD and tick symptoms and for adamoxetine for ADHD symptoms. In my, so I see a lot of people that have uh, ticks and ADHD in my own practice. I treat a lot more ADHD than ticks because I find that in my patients, the ADHD symptoms are typically uh, the more disabling symptoms. So we, we almost always start there. I mean, sometimes I have to treat the ticks as well, but usually I try treating ADHD first. Um, I usually start with methylphenidate um, just because I feel we have more data to support the use of this drug. Uh, in this specific population, I usually start with Concerta. That's just, you know, my, my, my practice. I don't think it, it's not wrong to start with Bifentin. Um, I think we just, you know, all of us have our individual prescribing patterns. And so I typically start with Concerta, uh, 18 milligrams, and then titrate up. Uh, based on efficacy and adverse effects. So, uh, you know, I, I, warn, I warn patients, I say like that you, there's a 20% chance that your ticks will worsen with this medication. Uh, if I gave you placebo, there's a 20% chance your ticks would worsen with placebo. Uh, 
So uh, that being said, there's an 80% chance your ticks will either improve or stay the same. So it's important to reassure patients because on the product monographs, like if they take out the product monograph and read it in full, it will say that if you have ticks, you shouldn't take this medication. And, you know, I think that's just, um, that that's because of many case reports that came out about tick worsening um, with psychostimulants. And it, it, it can happen. Like I have seen people over the course of my practice who have definitely worsened their ticks when I prescribed a psychostimulant uh, and they have not been able to use these drugs. Um, but I tell, I tell people that if that happens, it will be a transient worsening. It's, you know, your, your ticks are not going to worsen and, um, stay elevated after we discontinue the drug. So, you know, we discontinue the drug and the heightened ticks should subside. Some people will just get a transient elevation in their ticks. So, you know, I, I say, let's try it for at least a week. If your ticks worsen, uh, you know, it, they may come back down just because really uh, I think that psychostimulants are the most uh, effective treatment. I, I don't tend to put people on dextroamphetamine, so Adderall or Vyvanse. I don't use that as a first choice. But if people come in to see me and they're already taking uh, dextroamphetamine, I don't switch them. If they're tolerating the medication uh, well, and, and some people do, um, then I, I just leave them, I leave them on, on that drug. But anecdotally, I have seen more tick worsening with Vyvanse and uh, Adderall than with Concerta or Bifentin. Okay, so let's move on to talk about comorbid ADHD in people with OCD. And unfortunately, there's not really as much data on this topic as there is uh, for ADHD and Tourette syndrome. Uh, there is a really nice review that um, I would uh, recommend, and that's in the Harvard Review of Psychiatry with the first author, Abramovich, um, in 2015. So uh, in terms of the comorbidity, the reports are highly inconsistent, especially in pediatric studies. So the reported comorbidity ranges from zero to 60%. So it's a huge range. Um, but there's definitely lower comorbid rates reported in adolescents and adults compared to children. And the reason for this variation is, is probably methodological in terms of the studies. So most studies examine clinical samples from specialty clinics rather than uh, community-based samples. And we know that that results uh, in a bias uh, because people with... Uh, with more than one disorder are much more likely to have a greater symptom severity and are much more likely to reach a specialist clinic than someone who only has one disorder. Uh, there's also inconsistency in the inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria between studies. So studies that include children with Tourette syndrome and autism are going to have much higher rates of comorbid ADHD in children with OCD. Uh, so, and that's a fact. And many studies, um, and sorry, uh, there. If you look at at the studies, some of them were very pure that you uh, you couldn't have autism or or Tourette syndrome, and so their rates of ADHD in their OCD samples was was much lower. Um, and, and then gender ratios. So uh, studies that include more boys have higher rates of ADHD compared uh, to studies that are more equal in gender distribution because we know that ADHD affects more boys than girls. So there's only a very few studies that have reported the co-occurrence of OCD and people with ADHD. And there seems to be less variation from reported studies with comorbid OCD in three to 7.5% of children with ADHD. 
One study of adults, which used a nationally representative sample, reported that 2.7% of patients with ADHD had comorbid OCD, which resembles the prevalence of OCD in the general population, which is between 2 and 3%. So let's compare the phenomenology of OCD and ADHD. So OCD is a, it's a highly heritable disorder. So 40% uh, of OCD seems to be uh, inherited. Uh, onset is before the age of 18 in 25 to 50% of cases. It's an internalizing disorder, which is characterized by obsessions and compulsions. It is associated with harm or risk avoidance, restrained behavior, withdrawal and avoidance of novel stimuli. Uh, there are patients with OCD have lower levels of behavioral impulsivity than controls, and they typically show a positive response to selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and antipsychotics. And let's contrast that with ADHD. This is also a highly heritable disorder, uh, which is childhood onset, but it's an externalizing disorder characterized by inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. It is associated with risk-taking and novelty-seeking, and there is a positive response to psychostimulants. So, uh, Hollander described this impulsive compulsive continuum where impulsivity is at sort of one end of the continuum. So behaviors lacking forethought, limited ability to inhibit or postpone behaviors as well as risk-taking. Whereas compulsive behaviors are at the other end of the continuum where there are carefully planned rituals which are performed according to rigid rules harm avoidance and risk aversive behavior. So ADHD and OCD behaviorally seem to be on opposite ends of the spectrum. If we look at the neurobiology of ADHD and OCD, there's an abnormal pattern of brain activity in the frontostriatal system and network in both disorders. However, the functional abnormalities are very different between the, the two disorders. So OCD is associated with abnormally increased activity or hypermetabolism in the frontal and striatal regions. So this includes the orbitofrontal cortex, the basal ganglia, and the thalamus. And there is evidence of hyperactivated frontostriatal function, functional connectivity. That's in contrast to ADHD, which is associated with decreased activity or hypometabolism in prefrontal and striatal brain regions with reduced frontostriatal connectivity. If we look at the neuropsychology of these disorders, individuals with ADHD and OCD underperform relative to controls on tasks of executive function. So this includes working memory, planning, and response inhibition. The neuropsychological findings in ADHD are highly consistent between studies, whereas in OCD, they seem highly variable. Deficient performance of people with ADHD and people with OCD on neuropsychological tests may stem from different mechanisms. So one theory uh, regarding the relationship between ADHD and OCD is that people inherit both of these disorders as a distinct familial subtype. So they're inherited together. There's only one study that suggests that this is a possibility. Uh, this is a study by Geller published in 2007. And they found evidence to suggest that comorbid ADHD is a distinct condition in which the two disorders are genetically transmitted together. They uh, looked at a sample of children that had ADHD alone, ADHD and OCD, as well as controls. And they found that relatives of children with ADHD with or without OCD had similar and higher rates of ADHD than controls. However, the risk of OCD 
was elevated only among relatives of children who had ADHD and OCD. There's also this executive overload model of OCD, and this was proposed by Abramowicz in uh, 2012. And this model focuses on the cognitive cost of obsessions in OCD. So it's thought that the overflow of obsessive thoughts in OCD may overload the executive symptom, resulting in neuropsychological deficits. And so one could consider the neuropsychological impairments in OCD as an epiphenomenon, which are associated with the state-dependent symptom severity. This suggests that ADHD symptoms in OCD might actually be ADHD-like symptoms and may be the behavioral manifestations of OCD-related neurocognitive impairment. Such ADHD-like symptoms may be especially pronounced in children uh, due to developmental uh, maturity. So how do we treat ADHD in people with OCD? So I think the first point is to be very rigorous in your diagnostic approach. Are these truly ADHD symptoms or could these be ADHD-like symptoms uh, secondary to the OCD? So be cautious, psychostimulants can worsen OCD symptoms. So it's very important to titrate your medication slowly and monitor your response. Uh, you should consider treating OCD symptoms first, especially if there is significant impairment and then reevaluating the ADHD symptoms after the OCD symptoms have improved to see if these symptoms are still present. So in summary, if we, when we look at ADHD and Tourette syndrome, there is symptomatic overlap between these conditions. ADHD symptoms are usually more impairing than tics, and there's more evidence to support the use of methylphenidate than dextroamphetamine, and alpha agonists can be used adjunctively or alone to treat both conditions. For ADHD and OCD, the rate of occurrence is highly variable, but appears more common, especially in children. We need to evaluate children carefully and try to distinguish between true ADHD versus ADHD-like symptoms secondary to OCD and prioritize the treatment of OCD and reevaluate ADHD symptoms afterwards. So that's the end of my presentation. And I would be very happy uh, to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Bringsine. Um, attendees, if you do have questions, as I said before, please do post them in chat. Um, in the meantime, I will just launch the second poll for you to. I'm also happy to take comments and anybody's personal experience treating these two disorders together, if you have any. For assessing if symptoms are, are ADHD or ADHD-like, what tools do you use to assess these? So I don't use any formal tools uh, to distinguish the two. I think it's really exploring uh, the symptoms historically with the patient, right? Trying to understand um, their intrusive thoughts and if the intrusive thoughts are uh, what is interfering with their ability to attend and focus. Um, I, I, I tend to, I use the, the Connors, uh, three, uh, on, for, to evaluate symptom severity in, in, in patients. Um, I find that that's a, a, a very good tool overall. Um, I use the children's Yale Brown obsessive compulsive, uh, inventory and, uh, and, um, severity, uh, scoring. It can be challenging to tease things out. Uh, one one way or another, um, you know, one would expect that if OCD was interfering with uh, with 
uh, attention and focus, that we would see more inattentive ADHD and people with OCD. Um, but right now there's very limited data teasing out uh, ADHD subtypes um, based on whether or not someone has OCD. Um, I'm curious how, how other people uh, um, try to sort this out. I know that we have some people in the, I don't wanna put anyone on the spot, <laughs> but I know we have some people who treat a lot of OCD uh, on, the, on the call and if they would be uh, willing to chime in, uh, I would be, I would be, I would love to hear their perspective. Um, so feel free to um, unmute yourself and, and chat if, if, if you have, um, if you have, if it, if you, if you have something you want to share. There is another question in chat, Dr. Wingsan. Okay. Um, does the research tell us much about the difference between the 40% of people who appear to have inherited OCD traits and the 60% who don't appear to have evidence of heritability? So typically it's the young onset cases, uh, the children that are co-affected by Tourette syndrome that seem to be uh, more highly heritable. Um, the, the, the childhood onset cases um, compared to the adult onset uh, cases. And what is the incidence of comorbidity, other tick disorders, and ADHD? So, um, yeah, so it's interesting. So um, I can't quote you the exact numbers, but there are a number of studies that look at this. There's one recently um, published by Kirsten Mullerval, uh, where she looked at um, the different types of tick disorders. So Tourette syndrome, chronic motor tick disorder, chronic vocal tick disorder, and transient tics. And the rate of ADHD comorbidity uh, increased as you went through the continuum. So more children with Tourette syndrome had ADHD compared to children with transient tick disorder. If you look at the flip side, so the rate of Tourette syndrome in, uh, in an ADHD population, it's about uh, 20%. Any other questions or comments or clinical observations from your practice? Okay, so um, it says the pharmacology texts specify contraindications of methylphenidate for treating ADHD in persons with ticks, which we know is inconsistent with the research literature. In my experience, this tends to lead to undertreatment of ADHD in persons with ticks and undue anxiety for parents of children with both ADHD and uh, Tourette syndromes or, or chronic tick disorders. As a leader in the treatment of Tourette, do you know whether steps have been taken to correct this misinformation in the text used to train and guide pharmacists and prescribers? So, that, that was certainly the point of the Cochrane Review that we published uh, a few years ago was to try to inspire confidence among practitioners because I, I totally agree with you. I, you know, I, I have been operating the clinic since 2008 here in Alberta and I've tried to get the word out that people can use stimulants, but I still get referrals, um, you know, even 14 years later, people saying, can, can this child be treated for their ADHD because of that contraindication uh, uh, that's in the product monographs. Um, so uh, when I see people, I always, when I write the prescription for Concerta uh, in my patients, I say, you're going to see in the monograph that says you're not supposed to take this, but I, I'm telling you, you can't. So I've certainly tried to spread the word. I've spoken at conferences about this. Um, there was another um, paper published by the Yale group where they see a lot of uh, kids with Tourette and neurodevelopmental disorders, where they looked at uh, all the clinical trials 
of uh, psychostimulants and looked at rates of tick worsening um, in people treated with meth with psychostimulants versus placebo. And again, showing that the rate of tick worsening was not different between groups, um, you know, which also provides evidence that these medications uh, can be safely prescribed. I mean, we have to be aware there's going to be individual cases where there's a tick exacerbation, um, uh, but that certainly because of their efficacy, that this is a first line drug. Um, so uh, I, I haven't been involved in correcting any of the of the text to guide pharmacists. Um, you know, these are product monographs that um, are published like where there's like a, a I guess um, they go over the data from the clinical trials, the registration studies, um, and they have to report these things if they came up in the in the registration studies. Um, do we know much about people who appear to reduce or eliminate clinically significant obsessions or compulsions without use of medications and or exposure therapies? Um, so I don't, I don't, do you mean that their symptoms uh, resolve like with, with time? Is that what you're talking about? Like the natural history? It's the same question about symptoms or Tourette syndrome without medications and or behavioral therapies. <clears throat> I think you're talking about natural history, uh, but you, you're welcome to speak up if I'm misinterpreting you. Yes, or strategies that they come up with on their own. Um, so I guess let's talk about natural history first. So, you know, uh, we know the natural history of Tourette syndrome is that many people will resolve uh, in late adolescence. So if we look at symptom trajectory, usually onset between a four and seven, peak in severity between 10 and 12, and then uh, resolution between 14 and 17. And uh, that's in about 70% of kids by the time they reach adulthood, their tics will either be much better or even gone. And uh, I think that's brain maturation, right? We, we know that our ability that with uh, that our ability to suppress unwanted behaviors improves throughout childhood and adolescence. And that's due to myelination, the, those um, uh, our frontal lobes are the, the last part of our brain to develop those long uh, connections. Uh, and so our ability to sort of put the brakes on um, improves as we, as we mature. Um, and so um, I think that, you know, connections are being strengthened um, and our ability to say, you know, I don't have to do that. <laughs> um, uh, just uh, strengthens. I'm not sure what strategies people are using, but I, I feel that it's probably largely just, just uh, brain development. Um, childhood onset OCD seems to have a better prognosis than adult onset OCD. Um, so, and again, I think it's, I think it's a process of brain maturation. Uh, probably possibly learning as well. 